Again, Romans 11, verse number 6 is our starting point. We missed last Sunday due to Brother Matthew Oakley Cheney teaching our Bible class, so we want to resume Romans now at this time. How many chapters are in the book of Romans? 16. Some would say, and I might be among the number, that chapter 11 is the toughest of all 16 chapters to understand. Paul, or rather Peter, spoke of Paul's writings and said some of the things that Paul wrote were hard to what? Understand. And he may have had in mind Romans 11. And Peter was an inspired apostle of God. And if he had trouble understanding, well, you can see where that leaves us. But we'll give it a shot and see what we can learn as, as we go through the chapter. We know that we want to keep in all Bible verses, we want to keep these verses in their proper what? Context. Context. If we start lifting Bible verses out of context, then we're going to have Paul saying things he never, never intended to say. One reason why I prefer, this is just preference among preachers, but I prefer when I can to do verse-by-verse uh, -verse expositions of Scripture that is, take a section of Scripture and break it down, put it back together and see what it means, is we're not as likely to, again, pull verses out of context. Sometimes we present topical sermons where we pick a topic and then we look at passages that we think fit the topic. Well, sometimes those passages may not fit the topic. We're trying to fit the passage to the topic instead of the other way around. And so I, I enjoy uh, what we call expository lessons a bit more than at times topical lessons. All are good, obviously, but we want to make sure in any study that we carefully look at, at the context. And that's what we especially want to do in chapter 11. Again, Paul is stressing his concern in this letter for everybody. I don't want anybody to be lost. I don't want my fellow countrymen, the Jews, to be lost. I don't want any Gentile to, to be lost. And as Christians, we should have the same mindset. Everybody has their enemies, but we would not wish eternal hell on our worst enemy. And if we did, then we have a heart problem. We've all heard people in a fit of anger say, I hope you go too, and then they'll use the word place of, the place of torment. I hope you go there. Well, we hope that later on, you know, people rethink when they calm down and apologize because we hope, we don't hope anybody goes there. We know the majority of mankind will go there, but we don't hope for anyone to go there. We don't wish that on anybody. And Paul certainly did not. He did not at all. And you can just see his, his passion and frustration, if you will, especially on the part of his fellow Jews in their lost condition, having rejected Christ. So in chapter 11, Paul is calling for witnesses, trying to show to the Jews, you don't have to remain lost. You don't have to remain lost. Verse 1, Paul used himself as, as an example. I'm a Jew. God, God has not rejected the Jews just because they're Jews. I'm a Jew. He didn't reject me. He saved me. If he could save me, he can save you if you'll come to him. Verses 2 to 10, and this is where we are, he used the example of the prophet Elijah. Elijah in his day became despondent thinking he was the only one what? Left. He's the only one faithful. And God said, well, Elijah, you know, you, you're, you're looking down, you're discouraged, you've forgotten I've got 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. You're not the only one left. There were several Jews who were still faithful to God. And even as Paul pens this letter, he says there is in verse 5 a what? What words do you use in verse 5? Remnant. That doesn't mean the majority or most, but it does mean there are some Jews who have obeyed the gospel. God hasn't written every Jew off. If you'll come to him, he won't write you off either. And that's what the, the point that Paul is, is trying to drive home again and again. Now today, uh, we may think that we're the only ones doing right. 
But keep in mind that we are not God, and God knows everybody, and God knows everything. And even if we were the only ones doing right, that would not give us the excuse to do wrong. In his day, Noah was the only one doing right, he and his family. But instead of giving up and saying it's useless, what do you do? You just pressed on. You just keep faithful. So, and that's Paul's point here. I'm going to have Adam read for us Romans 11, 6 through about 10. Romans 11, 6 through 10. Paul is bending over backwards to stress the point, but at the same time show his concern for, again, especially he's addressing the Jews, and this he'll talk about the Gentiles here in, in, just, in just a moment. Really ought to have backed up to verse 5. Now, I know we looked at verse 5 two weeks ago where Paul spoke of the remnant according to the election of grace and then the thought of grace continues in verse number 6. The remnant of, the, of Jews who had been saved were saved by the grace of God, as all men are saved by the grace of God. I mean, we cannot be saved. We cannot say, God, I've done this and you owe me salvation. We cannot say that. Anybody who is saved will be saved by the grace of God. But if we pull this passage out of context, as a lot of folks do, you get the idea that we don't have to do anything to be saved. That God does it all and we do nothing. If it's by grace, then no works are involved, people say. And if works are involved in salvation, then grace is not involved at all. It's grace or works and there's no middle ground and there's no in in between. That's pulling the passage out of its context. Paul is talking about the Jews. He's addressing the Jews specifically here. They felt they were saved simply on the basis of, number one, being a Jew. Because of pedigree or ancestry. Because we're Abraham's seed, we're automatically saved. And because we're keeping, or keeping the law of Moses and our traditions, we are saved. And Paul says... You are wrong. Washing cups and pots and pans and hands and so forth. Paul would say back in chapter 10, it's impossible to be saved by a system of law because you have to keep the law perfectly if you're going to be saved that way. How many Jews kept the law perfectly? Only one. And that was Jesus, Jesus himself. Salvation by grace, yes. But salvation by grace does not mean we have nothing to do. Salvation by grace does not mean we have nothing to do. In fact, back in chapter 10, Paul would say that you should confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Is that doing something? That's doing something, isn't it? You must believe in your heart. Is that doing something? That's a conscious choice on my part. I am presented the truth. I consciously choose to either accept the truth or reject it, but that's my part. Okay? The Bible says that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to those who, what? Obey Him. Paul told the Philippians, work out your own Salvation. Well, Paul, I thought you said here that works weren't involved in salvation. And then in Philippians, you say that works are involved in salvation. It depends upon the type of works you're talking about. The works that God asks or demands of us to do certainly are essential to salvation. Okay? 
So we, we don't want to make the mistake of lifting this out of context and saying salvation is all of grace and we don't have to do anything. The Bible simply does not, does not say that. Even in John 6, 29, the Bible says that faith is a work. Faith is the work of God. Now, on the other hand, I am not going to be saved by any system of humanly devised works. The law of Moses could not save the violator. It had no conditions for forgiving sin. And any set of rules that I may conjure up will not save me either. If I give X amount of dollars to my favorite charity, if I wash an elderly person's car, if I mend a sick person's fence, I'll be saved. Well, that's my set of rules. Those are all great things to do, but I can do those things day in and day out, and God does not owe me salvation. That has nothing to do with my salvation. Unless God has specified, Wayne, if you'll mend somebody's fence, then you'll be saved. Well, if God said that, that's another matter. So I never get to the point where God owes me anything, but still if I'm going to be saved by faith and love, I obey what God has given me in the gospel, and then I live for Him. So again, keeping the passage in context. Talking specifically here to the Jews, thinking they could be saved by their works and by their pedigree. And Paul says, you're wrong. And so, having said that, verse 7, what then? Israel, talking about the Jews, has not obtained that which he seeketh for. Israel seeking for salvation. They're seeking the favor of God, but they've lost it. They haven't obtained it because they rejected Christ, the majority of the Jews. But the election, going back to verse 5, a remnant according to the election of grace, those Jews who had obeyed the gospel had obtained salvation, had obtained the favor of God, but sad to say the rest were what? Blinded, right? The rest were blinded. Anybody have a different translation on verse 7 for the word blinded? Anybody at all? Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Hardened. hardened. Some translations use the word hardened. It carries the same idea. Hardened or blinded. And the word literally means to cover with thick skin. To cover with thick skin, much like a callus. We've all had them, haven't we? If we're old enough, we've had them. A callus has no feeling, does it? It's just thick skin, layer of skin upon skin. Years ago, I developed not a callus, but a planter's wart on the bottom of one of my feet. And it didn't hurt until you walked on it. And the pressure from that hit nerves, and it got so bad, I went to the doctor. And of course, the doctor felt of it, didn't hurt when he felt of it, didn't hurt when I washed it or whatever, just when he stood on it, it was just thick, thick, thick. And the doctor said, Wayne, we've got two options here. Number one, I can perform surgery, or you can do your own surgery. Well, you know, that sounded good to me, not having a whole lot of money and, and, and things of that nature. This was years ago, but even then... And so I said, well, what do I do? He said, here's what you do. You get some salicylic acid, which is about like compound W, and you put that on there in the morning. You put a, piece of, put a Band-Aid around that. In the evening, take a razor blade, a sharp, sharp razor blade, and slice uh, just a paper-thin layer off of that wart. If you do that every day for a month, it'll be gone. Well, you know, doing your own surgery, you know, most doctors don't recommend doing your own surgery, but he was sort of a country doctor, and, and we, we loved him. And back in that day, I was a lot skinnier and a lot limberer than I am today. I don't know that I could do that today. You know, get your foot in your lap and take a razor blade and start cutting on it. But I, I did that. I did that, and I thought this is going to hurt. It's going to bleed. I didn't feel a thing. It was so much thick skin there. You could just 
slice every night just a paper thin layer after layer after layer in a month's time, guess what? I was as good as new, did not hurt, did not bleed one bit. Now, I'm not recommending anybody do that. I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea or sue me for false medical advice. That's what my doctor told me. My point is this word blinded or hardened means that thick, thick layer that has no feeling. And it's applied to the heart. And the point is, if you're not careful, if you keep on rejecting the truth, what might happen? You're hardened. You're not sensitive to the truth anymore. When you did something wrong, and the first time you did it and you knew it was wrong, your conscience bothered you. But the more you keep doing the wrong, the more you tune out the conscience, the thicker the skin gets, if you will, to the point it doesn't bother you at all any longer. We've all heard of what kind of criminals? Hardened criminals. Men and women who have no feeling, you can look in their eyes and there is no compassion, no remorse, sort of like looking at an animal, a hardened criminal, no feeling, no feeling. Well, that's bad, but it's even worse to develop that spiritually. And these Jews were heading down that path of continually rejecting Jesus. The more they did that, the more they were blinded or hardened Notice verse 8. According as it is written. By now you know whenever we come across that phrase, what question do we ask? Where is it written? So somebody tells me, tell me, where is this written other than Romans 11? I know, I know it's written in Romans 11, but Paul is quoting another Bible verse. And that Bible verse is maybe more than one. Isaiah 29, 10. Uh, you may have one in Psalm. You may have Deuteronomy 29. There are actually several of these. Paul uses the writing of the Jews. Again, they accepted, at least they accepted, they said they accepted the Old Testament. Let me use your own writings from Isaiah. God has given them the spirit of slumber. What does it mean to slumber? Some say that preachers do this every Sunday. Give people the spirit of slumber. Some of you are just about there right now, aren't you? Spirit of slumber. God has given them the spirit of slumber. Some translations use the word stupor. Slumber, I guess, sounds better. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Here were people who did not want to hear. Here were people who did not want to see. Here were people who did not want to understand. God says, if that's what you want, guess what? That's what you get. That's what you want. That's what you get. It's not that they could not see or could not hear. They deliberately said, we don't want to see. We don't want to hear. God says, have at it. Unto this, unto this very day. I'm going to get Adam, if you will. Adam, read for us Acts 7, verse 51. Adam talked about Stephen not long ago in a Sunday morning sermon. And so I think Acts 7, 51 will, again, add some additional comment to what Paul says here in verse 8. Notice as Adam read, who resisted? They resisted. They chose to resist. We don't want to get the idea that God didn't want to save them and so made it impossible for them to be saved. They made the choice of resisting. If that's what you want, have at it. That's what you get is the idea. Hardened, seared, callous to the truth because of a choice. Verse 9, let me give you another quote from the writings you so love, as you say. Let me tell you what David said. Where did David say this, by the way? Anybody have a reference there? Psalm 
Okay? Psalm 69, that, that tiny print is awfully hard to see. I see a Psalm 69, I think 22 maybe in my reference there, but uh, this is a quote from David. And this is one of the Psalms that David wrote. Let their table be made a snare. Whenever we think of a table, do we think of something bad? Everybody come to the table, it's time to... We think of something good, don't we? You think of a table, you think of things that are good. Okay? You think of blessings. Well, let their table be made something that is intended for good. Let it be made a snare or a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. The blessings that God gave them should have led them to Christ, but instead became a snare that kept them from Christ. As one said, so secure, so self-satisfied being a fleshly descendant, it became the very thing that ruined them. Their being a Jew became the thing that ruined them because they simply thought being a Jew would save them. Their blind devotion to the law kept them from seeing the beauties of the gospel is how another worded that. Continuing in verse 10, let their eyes be darkened, spiritual blindness that they may not see and bow down their back always. To bow down the back means to bend together. The older we get, a lot of us, gravity does a number on the body, right? You know, one time we stood straight tall, but then gravity starts pulling us down, pulling us down. And uh, there, there are some poor people because of uh, you know, different injuries or bodily conditions who have to walk over almost bent double, and you, you, feel, you feel for them. Captives often had a load on their back, and they were, because of the heaviness of that load, they had to walk bent over. That's the idea here, being bent over. Bow down their back always. As of captives whose backs were bent under the loads they had to carry, to bend together. Adam, if you're still in Acts, uh, if you will, Acts 15 and verse 10 for us. Acts 15 is the Jerusalem conference, as there were Jews who said, yeah, in order to be saved, you had to be circumcised to be saved. Acts 15, verse 10. Now therefore, why think ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? You are adding requirements to salvation, including circumcision. That was a burden. You're putting burdens on people, a yoke on people that God never intended Paul says there in Acts, or that, I'm sorry, it's, it's said there in Acts, the 15th chapter. They are responsible for this condition. They are responsible for being bent over because, again, of their rejecting Christ. Paul is saying in chapter 11, I'm, I'm giving you witness this is to show that God loves you, Jews, that you don't have to be lost. I'm a witness, and Elijah is a witness. And believe it or not, the Gentiles are a witness, and that's verses 11 through 24. Talking about the fall of the Jews, verse 11. I say then, have they, Jews, stumbled that they should fall? In other words, did Israel transgress in order that they might fall? No, they didn't intend to do that. They didn't aim to lose God's favor, God forbid. But ironically, something good came out of something bad. You may recall that on one missionary journey, Paul was going from place to place, and he was talking to some Jews, and they rejected him, ran him out of town after town, until finally said, Paul, Paul said to them, guess what? I'm shaking the dust of my feet off against you, and I'm turning to who? The Gentiles, the Gentiles. Something bad, the Jews rejecting Christ, sort of like this all things work together for good, turned into something good. Through their fall, the Jews fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. 
This was not only to save the Gentiles, but also to do what to the Jews? Provoke them to jealousy. Provoke them to jealousy. One would think the Jews, seeing the despised Gentiles come to God for salvation, one would think the Jews ought to be happy for the Gentiles. And this would provoke them, this jealousy of these people would provoke them, you know what, we too need to get right with God. But sad to say with most, it didn't have that, that reaction. Verse 12, now if the fall of them, Jews, be the riches of the world, whoever, Jew or Gentile, but, but primarily Gentile here, and the diminishing of them, Jews, the riches of the Gentiles, instead of the Jews coming around and doing right, Paul says how much more their fullness. Not fullness in salvation, but fullness of hatred. Fullness of hatred that culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem about 12 years after this letter was written in A.D., the year number 70. God's will is going to be accomplished whether we work with God or against God. Here the Jews are working against God, but still His will is being accomplished and taking the gospel to whomever will listen, including the Gentiles. Now let me address you Gentiles, verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. Now, does that mean that Paul never talked to the Jews at all? We've already seen he did. But primarily, his work was to work among the Gentiles. Primarily, which other apostle worked with the Jews? Starts with a P, Peter. Peter primarily worked with the Jews, that's Acts 1 to 12. Paul primarily worked with the Gentiles, that's Acts 13 to 28. But there were exceptions. In fact, who was the first Gentile convert on record? Cornelius, and who taught him? Peter, not Paul. Though Paul was apostle of the Gentiles, it was Peter who taught. So there were exceptions. We say Peter primarily the apostle of the Jews, and Paul primarily the apostle of the Gentiles. It wasn't that, that Paul hated his people, again, we, we emphasize that, but that God had a mission for him to go and be an apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. That is, I work among the Gentiles to the full extent of my ability. One thing about Paul, he had a characteristic, there was not a lazy bone in his body. I get the idea by reading Paul, he was not lazy. Whatever he did, he did it full bore. Even when he was doing wrong, what? Zeal, zeal, zeal. He was a man who was zealous for whatever he believed in. And now that he is an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify, I'm giving, I'm giving this my all. We've all heard the saying, if anything is worth doing, what? It's worth doing right. If it's worth doing, and saving people is worth doing. And Paul says, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm doing it right. And he's glad that the Gentiles are obeying the gospel and are being saved. What Old Testament prophet was sent to some Gentiles and was mad that they became converted? Jonah. How unlike Jonah, Paul was. I'm glad the Gentiles are coming to Christ. In fact, verse 14, I haven't forgotten about the Jews. If by any means I may provoke to emulation or jealousy them which are my flesh. Again, talking about who's Paul's flesh? Jews. And might save some of them. Again, some look at Romans 11 and say Romans 11 teaches that one day every Jew is going to be converted. Jewish conversion to Christ. Sad to say some of the policy of our nation is misguided toward Israel 
based on the idea that their land is the holy land and that one day all the Jews will be converted and so, you know, you treat with kid gloves these people. Well, that's not good policy. We want to treat with kid gloves everybody. We don't want to disrespect anybody. But again, uh, Romans 11, Paul knew that all Jews would not be saved. In fact, verse 14 says, I might save what? All of them? Some. Might save some of them. Again, by the Gentiles obeying the gospel, Paul hoped to, because of the jealous Jews, to use their jealousy to stir them up and rouse them to study and dialogue and, and render obedience to the gospel. But again, instead of being stirred up to obey, many became further, further hardened. I want to save some, and that ought to be our desire as Christians. We're not going to save everybody, but we can try. We can try to save some. I want to start with myself. I want to start with my family. I want to continue with my church family. I want to extend to the community, and as we're able, to the world itself. Jesus did not save everybody. He did save some. We need to have a burning desire for people who are lost. Verse 15. For if the casting away of them, Jews, this is all in context here, be the reconciling of the world, everybody including Gentile, to God. We talked about this word reconcile before. The prefix re means what? Again, if I repaint the house, that means I painted it once and I want James to do it again, don't I? Repaint, paint again. Reconcile means to consile or make friends again. Whenever we were born into this world, we were automatically a friend of God. I sinned. I lost that friendship. I need to have my friendship restored to God. That's what Jesus is all about. So, the Jews rejected Christ. That opened the door for the reconciling of the world, the Gentiles. For those Jews who receive Christ and obey Christ, what shall, receive, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Those Jews who decided that we're going to you know, swallow our pride and we're going to listen to what Paul has to say about the Lord and we're going we're gonna to obey the gospel, life. From the dead. We were dead, but now we're alive in Christ. The prodigal son came to himself, and he went back to his father. And his father said, This my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The same thing could happen to the Jews. That's, that's what my goal is, Paul says. I don't want anybody to be lost. Verse 16, if the, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, but it's talking about their sacrifices. They knew about sacrificing. And if the root be holy, now this is something we can sort of grasp, so are the branches. Jewish converts to the truth, the first fruits, all of fleshly Israel could likewise be holy. If like these Jews converted, they likewise would convert. If the root, the first Jewish converts, be holy, then so are the branches. Again, refers to Israel. They too could be, they could be accepted of God as well. We've really come to a good stopping place for today. We'll pick up in verse 17 next week and maybe... Try to wrap up Romans 11 next week, starting in verse number 11. Sort of uh, something that I think we can grasp from the world of either agriculture or horticulture, whatever you want to call it. But we'll save that for next week, Romans 11, verse 17.